Gresham College presents Reducing Inequalities in Child Health, Part 4 Outcomes and Change, New Thinking in the Third Sector by Sharon Witherspoon Right, well, I'm delighted and flattered to be asked to speak here at Gresham College, an institution I've long admired, and that's partly because it does indeed share some of the same Enlightenment values that the Nuffield Foundation, of which I'm the director, shares. That is, it really believes in public debate and discussion, not in the form of a Punch and Judy show, but really trying to generate light rather than heat. But I want to start by saying that uh, I'm not a substantive expert on child health, certainly not in the narrow sense of physical health, but even in the wider sense that encompasses mental health and child well-being, where we do quite a lot of funding, I wouldn't claim that I'm an expert of the, in the way that the previous speakers have been. And since you'll all have heard my accent, I can admit to being an American by birth, although I've lived here for 35 years by choice, and I'm not going to be supporting um, the American welfare system. Um, but I'm also not going to make the same kind of advocacy-based arguments using evidence, but very clear advocacy arguments, of the sorts that uh, Hel Helen and Danny and, and Judy's done uh, about the need to use really government public policy to reduce inequalities in order to improve child health. That's not to say I don't believe that. It's just not the point I want to make. I want to talk about charities in the third sector, which by definition although they can influence, they can lobby, not in a party political way, but they can influence those debates, but they can't deliver those alone. So I want to talk about some of the things going on in the third sector, as Helen asked me to do, and to, I hope, get us to, to think a bit more about some of the good news stories, but not, I suspect, without getting a frisson of anxiety before I get to the happy news. Now, just to say, first instance, we're a small funder by comparison with many funders. Our total spend each year is about 11 to 12 million. About 7 million of that is in grants to others. The rest are activities like the Nuffield Council on Bioethics, which some of you might or might not know about. It's not staff costs. Um, and uh, as this slide shows, we span a range of things, including education, and we fund a lot of science and maths education. We use, for various reasons, to be much bigger than we are. We actually part fund a job Royal bank, and therefore we care about science and maths education. But our education work includes a lot of work on early years, both for educational and other purposes. We spend about 1.1 million on children and families directly, including law reform relevant to children, uh, early years in child care, the child protection system, and the evidence related to that. And about another one and a half million on social policy, much of it research on social policy, much of it for work on poverty and disadvantage. So I'd guess all in all, somewhere between four and five million a year of what we spend is on work relating to children one way or another. And that's a large sum to be giving away if we don't think carefully about how best we can use it to make a difference. Because after all, our fundamental aim is, um, is to make a, a difference in the rather old fashioned word of our trustee, it's the advancement of social well-being, particularly by means of scientific research and we take that rather seriously. So about two thirds of what we fund is research and the rest is practical innovations and evaluations of them. And one of the larger projects we've had running for some time now is an evaluation of a family drugs and alcohol court system, which aims to bring together the child, the court-based child protection system with fast, speedy and high quality delivery of drug services and other forms of family help to actually say within a time frame that makes a difference to a child, can we deliver some support and can we then make a better judgment about whether the child should, can stay with their family, birth family or go into care. Well, all this activity has made us and many others in the charitable sector think much more carefully about how we know if various activities do make a difference. At the simplest, are they actually even good for children? If so, how good? How much difference it makes? And that sounds obvious, but of course, if you think about the charity sector, much of it has grown up from the grassroots level, based on the commitment and passions of people who see a problem and think quite rightly they want to do something about it. And I hope all of us can applaud that. 
but it can lead the sector as a whole to focus on what it's doing, mentoring, mediation, soup kitchens, rather than what is the ultimate aim? Is it actually changing people's lives? Is it reducing the number of people who need soup kitchens? So many of us now, over the last decade or so, have been thinking more and more about how the third sector has to face this challenge, given the very clear, passionate, emotional commitment of many of the people who work in it. And to start, of course, I want to flesh out a little bit, not, not at any length, about what's meant by the phrase the third sector. Many of you will know that, but some of you may not. And just as the private sector is diverse, ranging from Barclays Bank on the one hand to John Lewis or Apple to your local news agent, and the public sector, although it derives its funds ultimately all from public revenues, is also diverse. You think about a central government spending department versus the treasury, much less compared to a local council or a quango. But the third sector is just as heterogeneous. And I think one of the reasons that phrase became popular as opposed to charity is actually to help us think about that a little bit better. So I recognize there's all the world of difference between a well-endowed foundation like my own, which works largely by giving money away for activities that link evidence and practice, between that and small charities, local charities, that organize local volunteers to do something for children, or the larger children charities that raise funds for a range of activities, who often have large workforces of professional paid staff, and often work with the public sector and indeed in, are increasingly dependent upon partnerships or contracts with the public sector. And I think it's fair to recognize, looking back, it's partly these larger children's charities that have helped nudge us to think about outcomes more carefully and perhaps more skeptically. I want to pay particular thanks to Helen Roberts herself, whose own particular contribution was immense, as she was one of the first who brought a What Works perspective to the work of Bernardo's, which is one of the larger children's charities. The key question she started asking with others, how do we know what works? How do we know whether it does any good at all? How do we choose where to put our resources? Bernardo's raises some money from fundraising from the public. How does it choose where to put that? And I have to say, we all acknowledge in my part of the world, and I, I think increasingly people do, that there is an element of values in all of that. And not only is there, there should be. It would be wrong to think that we lived in a world where we really did have some sort of techn technically neutral, expertise-driven set of decisions about a lot of these issues. But even if the notion of being wholly evidence-based is not only unachievable, but actually undesirable, we can use evidence better to influence how to make a difference. So what I'm going to go through is some examples of how we're trying to grapple with these issues and to deal with that in particular in the third sector, the whole mass of people who work with a genuine desire to do good but in a state of imperfect knowledge. So here's a couple of themes I want to talk about. First, we really have to start emotionally understanding the potentially humbling truth that plausibly good actions may not only be ineffective, they can be harmful. Now that is so counterintuitive when you know the, the uh, emotions or the passions people are bringing to what they're doing, particularly where children are concerned. But I want to give an example of that and how that you know, is a chastening experience to those of us who give money or the people who work in the children's sector. Second, we have to acknowledge that some programs, plausibly good programs, I say, they look like they might be good, are simply more effective than others. And in a world where resources are always finite, and that isn't just true because of the crash or because of the public policy responses to the crash, um, but in a world where resources are finite, we, we need to always be thinking about that. Third, we have to acknowledge that in vast areas to do with children's health, particularly in the wider sort of interests that organizations like mine care about, which is to do with mental health and well-being in a different sense, we know there's a relationship with deprivation and inequality, but we don't, aren't actually as sure about what we might do about it. Yes, we might do some very big public policy things to reduce inequality, but in the meantime, we also don't know how to get into this particular relationship. 
And that's partly because we just don't have the information about it. And I think that means we need to embrace the partial nature of what we know and embrace it enthusiastically. That's not a reason to get depressed. It is a reason to think smarter about the iterations between what we do and what we find. And I'll give you some examples. I think that's an issue most people now understand better, but we don't do much to put it into practice. We very rarely evaluate anything the charity both sector does. We also need to see, use that evidence to devise things longer term to keep us on our, our toes. And that I'm, I'm going to talk about, I think, some promising signs there. Finally, we need to say values do matter. There will be different charities, and just as there are different people in a democracy that have different values. And one of the reasons we need to be careful about using evidence is because that is a way we can sometimes get agreement on higher level values and then actually say, well, does it work to do what you think? Or is the choice of what you're doing um, actually not going to deliver what you want? And a classic example is trying to increase the number of stable partnerships, if you will, or marriages among people who have children in deprived uh, backgrounds. I think there's very good evidence that family stability matters, and it matters for any of us. I'm not saying people should never get divorced. I'm just saying we would all like it if people had children in, sta in stable and loving relationships. But that the answer to that is marriage counselling, you know, when things are going wrong or a couple of health visitor classes early on is pretty underwhelming. So if we think about that, we have to think about how we do things, not just what we're trying to do. So that's always an important caution. And of course, we've talked a bit about this and I won't belabor the point. We do need to think not just about the small interventions of the small charities, but whether any of that can actually lead to discussions about bigger level changes. Because as for reasons I think you've heard, there are some reasons to think that some of these things require more thoroughgoing changes. So, and I'm, I'm going to just allude to the fact that, for instance, with the government's plans for troubled families, which they sort of notionally decided, and the previous government had a, a thought about this too, that about 120,000 families were the problem families and we were going to intervene in some ways, which are rather unspecified, um, to do something about them. And these are troubled families. I mean, they're in touch with a range of social services on a range of issues. So I don't deny that, although I don't think the 120,000 estimate is very um, clear. But I think the problem is whether to doing something about that requires some of the same arguments about institutional change. And again, I'm going to just end with some thoughts on that. But first, a good and I think convincing example of how a well-meant intervention can do harm. And I always think it's really important for people to spend just a minute thinking about it because actually we all like to think that, well, we our common sense will get us through uh, a lot of thinking about this, but it doesn't always. So I've taken it out of the realm of current contentiousness and saying I think one of the best examples is the Cambridge Somerville Youth Study. That study started in 1935. It was based on a humane view that young boys at risk of becoming delinquent might benefit from some counseling, they called it, but it was actually much more like mentoring about a couple of hours a month of mentoring where they actually worked with the boys, they talked to them about what they could do with their life, they did refer them on to get you know, charitable help if they needed or doctor's appointments, so there was some practical help involved, but a lot of it was a kind of forerunner of the kind of mentoring programs that are still in use here with young people at risk of delinquency. And the program was unusual in that because it was done in Cambridge, Massachusetts, so Harvard University, there was a very well-designed study of it. And what they did is they took 506 boys, actually there were more, but these are the ones they followed up long-term, who were aged 5 to 13. They matched them by whether they were at high or average risk of getting arrested, getting in various kinds of trouble. And a very clear set of criteria they used to get these, you know, here are a group of boys that we think are at high risk, here are a group of boys we think are at average risk. They then randomly allocated those to getting a treatment or to having nothing, just watching and interviewing. And there can be effects of that, but I won't go into that. 
And the treatment was, as I said, this counseling or mentoring about twice a month for five years. So, you know, not insignificant, took a lot of time and, and money, but we might think now, you know, that question what can, that can do. And it did direct voice to various agencies, it unlocked some, unlocked some summer camp participation, as I said, some health and so on. And it was explicitly also aimed at talking about what they could do and what life challenges there were. Well, what were the results? Now, I've slightly given it away because I said we need to think about things that look plausible, but that don't deliver what we want. I think it's fair to say in the short term, the measures they first use, whether the boys and their families continue to take part, whether they liked it, they liked it, they really did like it. Uh, that looked like a success story. But then in the 1970s, the study was rediscovered. I don't think it was quite like going into a library and finding an index file full of names and addresses, but it really was picked up again by a different group. And they not only traced the boys and went back to interview them, they got permission to look at official data on arrests, to look at various health treatment services, and so on, because they were worried the people they might trace or they might interview might be different from the people who wouldn't agree to be interviewed. That was true too. What they found was that there had been no impact on juvenile or adult arrest rates, no difference in the number of serious crimes or the age of first committing crimes or the age of ceasing crime, because of course, as we now know, many even very troubled young people do stop after that peak period in their, in their early to mid-twenties. No difference in treatment rates for alcoholism or mental health, but the treatment group was worse in, a, in the number of crimes they committed, in the self-reported levels of their alcoholism, and they died younger. They died younger. This was harmful. Right. And, you know, when you first, I remember first reading about this and you actually, your heart quivers. It's physical reaction. This is harmful. Particularly because when they interviewed them, the subjective evaluations were positive. The men all said, this was great. This changed my life. You know, it was the best thing that ever happened to me. There's caution there too. Now, what does this mean? D does this mean we really should uh, not like these kinds of interventions and want a short, sharp shock? No, because the social scientists were better than that. They, led by a team led by Joan McCord, but there were many people involved, they were at pains to try to examine rigorously why the results were the way they were. And the hypothesis they came, they, that was supported by the evidence said that the damaging effects were caused by the fact that the constant attention and encouragement by the counselors raised expectations beyond the point that there was any realistic chance the boys could fulfill them. They didn't have the practical help to get better education. They didn't, you know, if they fell and they stumbled into the uh, criminal justice system, they weren't picked up. Uh, it didn't make real differences to their lives. It raised their expectations. And that was the reason the subjective uh, assessment was so high. But it does make us think about some of the kinds of things we've been talking about, about what does it make, mean to make a real difference in someone's social life. And what it meant in this case was it could have given the boys practical tools for coping, vocational education, reading skills, etc., etc. And it also probably suggests we need to think about dose response. Can a shallow, relatively shallow intervention turn people's lives around? But there's an import another important lesson here, which is that we're all very reluctant to produce evidence that said we tried something and it didn't work. And medical trials are acknowledging that problem all the time, although big money means that's continuing to be an, an issue. And those of you that ring, bit, read Ben Goldacre will know this, but it's been known for a while. But in the charitable world, we have the same problem. So many people working because they have humane motives and convictions find it very hard to even want to ask the question, does it work? Because of course they're worried. Is that gonna undo the work of their charity? And these have been some of the problems that underpinned our problems with Sure Start, where actually there's very good evidence that it does good things, but it could have been so much better if they'd paid attention to evidence rather than some of the advocacy, some of it led by the charitable sector, about what they should include in Sure Start. Right, well, I will now be going much more quickly, but I do always like to just be clear that that is the reason why we pay attention to evidence. It is not to make careers for social scientists. 
It's not because we believe somehow that it's magic. It's not because I believe it's always very convincing at getting government or whoever to do what they ought to do. It is because it improves what we do. So now just a quick skitter through. In childcare, someone raised that earlier and I decided to sit on my hands. Uh, there, are, there is some really good evidence about early years childcare, but there are some surprising gaps that we would not have if it were a medical issue. So, for instance, we know that children from uh, um, more disadvantaged homes really can have a difference made to their lives if they get good, high quality early years childcare. It's not the same as reducing inequality, but it can ameliorate that. But what we don't really know much about is what high quality means. It tends to get reduced to just the number of staff, the staff-child uh, ratio rather than the quality of staff. We know a bit about it, but we could know more. We really don't at the, are at the early stages of understanding that in the context of resource constraints. And there are some eminent social scientists who are working on all of this. We don't haven't really got as much idea as we'd like to have about the outcomes we should be focusing on. If you look at the last government and this government's uh, proposals about publicly funded or supported early childcare, there is a heck of a lot about school readiness, but that is often interpreted in terms of can you recognize letters, can you sign your name, can you tie your shoe, that sort of thing. Now, those are important, don't get me wrong, those are important. But there is a growing body of research, which is elegantly demonstrated by the work of Professor Terry Moffat and her colleagues, that shows that independently of IQ or income or cognitive measures, self-control has a long-term impact on life chances. That's health outcomes, ranging from early drug taking, car accidents, et cetera, et cetera, to all sorts of things. Health and wealth and well-being outcomes. And of course, much of what we know about the early years uh, education in Northern Europe focuses on just those issues. Learning to take turns, learning to plan, learning to work in a group to try to do something. Part of which is about learning self-control and self-control in a social setting. And indeed, there's some evidence that being in mixed groups, i.e. having universal nursery education, is not only particularly good for the disadvantaged, it's also fine for the better off, because for young children the differences are, are less stark. So that, again, might make us think about moving from an intervention to a policy. But it all gets rather messy because we really don't know about, about a lot of this. You know, we, we, we don't have the evidence that we could even make a rational case in a very strong and robust way. We have lots of bits of things that some of us read as pointing one way and other people might plausibly say doesn't. Well, my view of this is we have to think this is just a vortex. You know, we are caught in a funnel. And the question is the relation between evidence and what we do and how we argue for bigger changes and more evidence and what we do. And we're not going to ever reach a state of perfect knowledge. We shouldn't worry about that. But we can choose what kind of vortex we're in. So we either get into a world where some of us disregard evidence or some of us use it badly to underclaim or overclaim. Or some of us, you know, just are at the mercy of events versus the kind of vortex where we know we're going upwards, we're going up to the light and the air, it's beneficent, and we're, we're really feeling that this is a positive thing. And so, again, I'm not naive that evidence alone is enough, but I do think it's something we need to be paying more attention to. So the last three quick examples. Actually, I'll go backwards. Um, First one that I expect to be contentious, but I'm going to raise it anyway, the Robin Hood Foundation in New York City, which is funded by hedge fund and financial managers in New York, was funded in the wake of the much smaller financial crash of 1987, and takes money from the rich, though not through taxes, of course, through charitable contributions, and makes grants to nonprofit groups with the aim of reducing poverty in New York City and at least partly with the aim of trying to reduce root causes. So there's lots of work with children and families. In 2008, it gave away about $130 million. It's a big, big amount of money. In the last few years, it's introduced a novel way of helping it decide what to give money to. I won't describe this in full. Uh, there's a very nice Harvard Business School case study, for those that way inclined. Uh, but in essence, they use social science literature 
about the effects of various things based on proper evaluation. So the effects of teaching reading or maths, uh, the effects of uh, interventions on health, the effects of you know, buying scanners in health centers, uh, the effects of art therapy versus basketball club, you know, you name it, they, they do. They look at these things, they say, is there evidence? They ask the organizations they fund to collect good information about the number of children they help, the number of staff they pay, the number of unpaid volunteers, and they try to get a, an estimate, and I mean it, dollar estimate, of how much return there is on various types of programs. Now, when you first read this, I'm sure you find it kind of worrying. Oh my God, we're measuring everything by money. It's absolutely appalling. Uh, isn't it a bit like NICE, the National Institute for Clinical Excellence, which of course has to make everything or makes, starts out with a notion of quality adjusted life years. It's based on empirical evidence about what kinds of things people find challenging or difficult or make life not worth living versus worth living and then looks at the cost and then says, how much does it cost us to extend life by year? And you know, there is a point at which you say life has a, an irreducible value. But if you're rationing resources, what do you do? So very, I think it makes one think, and I certainly felt some concern. But when you look at what they do, the Robin uh, Foundation doesn't use their figures as some absolute religious uh, you know, goal. You know, if we do it 10 to 1, then we're going to fund it, and if not. But what they have found is that looking at things in this way, A, keeps them on their toes about evidence, about outcomes in particular, and B, can inform their judgments, not determine them. So there's a very good discussion in the uh, Harvard Business Review case study, but also you can read about it uh, in their work, to make you realize they really aren't using it in that way. And, and let me give you a couple of examples. You can see that they've got different years here. So they've got the benefit to cost ratio for different years for different types of programs. And what you can see is that, look, those estimates kind of jump around. Look at the difference, the first set of red circles, 70 to 1 versus a 15 to 1 return. Now, that can be because they, the social science evidence was pretty poor and it got better. It could be because the inputs and outputs changed. It could be because the particular programs in that area changed. They don't really, they're not saying there's something really true about 50 to 1. What they're saying is it's in this area and we need to think about that rate of return. And if you look at the second, the bottom circles, you can see that kind of health technology may have less of a return than other kinds of public health measures. That's, that's a nice thing to know. So it does just help you talk about it. And I don't know whether it's apocryphal or not, but I was told by someone who knew about them that this had caused quite a free saw in their early days with uh, particular kinds of things they funded. So for instance, they used to fund a lot of art therapy. And you can imagine why it allows children to express their feelings about what are often very frightening parts of life. It brings work to underemployed artists who are popular with grant givers generally. And it has tangible outputs, all that lovely art. But if you look at it and think about what does it do for their chances of getting out of long-term poverty compared to maths or English or you know, basketball or whatever, don't know what comparisons they made, you might wonder whether it's where you should put your funds. And I gather there was quite a long discussion about that in the early days, about maybe they shouldn't put so much money into this. So it does help keep our, our hearts somewhat under the control of our heads. Second interesting example going on in charitable giving is the big lotteries, that's the national lottery, a program on improving futures. Now, this is a program that's giving 26 million pounds over a five-year period to transform outcomes for children living in families with multiple and complex needs, a bit like troubled families. Only, so each sector project has been awarded up to about 900,000 to deliver their projects. It is aimed at some longer-term transformations. It's not just saying, how can we produce a little change over these years? But it was based on using evidence to help select the projects, something the lottery, I think, has been rightly criticized for not doing. You know, it was just, this is evidently a good thing, we must fund it, as opposed to saying, actually, in some of these children's programs, we should be using evidence to say what works better than others. And it's collecting an independent evaluation afterwards, looking at the effects of what those have done and also their cost effectiveness. It's also committed to sharing, I hope they mean pushing, that evidence uh, to a wider group in the public sector and elsewhere. 
And that illustrates the issue about pluralism and values too. Because after all, BIG, or the National Lottery, is funded by a proportion of profits from the lottery and has, an, has to be publicly legitimate and accountable. Now, I'm not referring, going to refer to the issue of whether lotteries are a form of exploitation of the poor, given who takes part. I don't think that's an interesting issue. But I am referring to the point that although BIG has often given funded courageously to unpopular causes, like migrants or people with mental health problems, it does understand that it's got to be seen to be serving the nation. And you can see from this map that there is a geographical spread, and I'm sure they took that into account in their decision making. And I'm sure they looked at different types of interventions and sectors. I'm just at the end. But it, it can show that it is adding value above and beyond the grants by doing this and by using that to push its message. Now, finally, two little projects we're funding, not so little, uh, about childcare. And both are trying to make precisely that move between the small scale intervention to what can we say about policy. The first one is at the LSE, and it involves looking at a range of international evidence about what we think we know about high quality in early child care. Then it looks at what disadvantaged children in this country actually get. Because some insure start areas or local authority nurseries or what used to be local will get very high quality child care and some won't. So we need to look at that. And then it looks at four or five other countries that use universal or tax funded or you have a voucher system or the market like we in the United States have to see what difference it might make if we delivered it a different way in terms of children's outcomes. And I think that's clearly valuable. The second is related, but has some overlap. But it looks at the effects not only on children's outcomes, but on mothers' employment. And that's because there we do know quite a lot about why mothers working can be good for even young children. Not for infants, that good argument for long maternity leave. But that for young children, mental health outcomes improve if mothers generally are working, if they're able to work. And again, I'm not talking about forcing people, but if they're able to work, we know it increases their long-term economic benefit and crucially, it reduces poverty. And that's really important. So this study looks at those two outcomes together. Again, it looks much more carefully at the costs of different ways of providing childcare, including whether it makes a difference not only who pays for it, government or not, but how it's paid. Is it paid by government through taxes, through childcare tax benefits? How efficient are those in narrow economic terms? And then it looks again at the same quality trade-off. And I think the question we're really asking is, does addressing these issues using childcare require rather larger policy change than simply giving people an extra hour or two of childcare a week? Uh, so I'm not naive enough to think that's going to change any policies in the short term, but I think we do think this is a useful thing to do to get a range of people across all political parties and across many childcare workers thinking about it. Now, for me, I hope I persuaded you that asking these difficult questions about what works really matters. And not only that, it should matter. And that it isn't just a story of doom and gloom, which many of us working with research have often felt that research is much better about saying what doesn't work. It, there, it, there are stories of kind of optimism and hope, and it is something I think all of us in the charitable sector can and will be paying much more attention to. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. I mean, I think that um, uh, <clears throat> Sharon has made a compelling argument, um, uh, not least by giving us that uh, evidence from, um, from the uh, study from the States, um, that an evidence base is really important, that these questions do need to be um, asked, because otherwise we'll end up um, actually focusing on doing things that, um, uh, sadly, as you, as you demonstrated to us, could actually cause harm when we, when we think that we're doing, when we think that we're doing good. Um, so, anybody, the provost, whoa. <laughs> this is gonna be a really good question. Yeah. <laughs> Can't guarantee that. Um, uh, thank you, Sharon, that was fascinating. Um, I wondered whether, uh, 
this may exist already, but whether the, you think that you could develop some kind of template for evaluation to be used by third sector voluntary organizations. The reason I'm thinking of this is that I was involved for some time with, with a very big and well-known um, voluntary sector organization, which I won't name, um, which essentially did virtually no evaluation of its work. Um, there were some special reasons for that possibly, but I think it was more that they simply didn't think in those terms. Um, and therefore they didn't know the kinds of questions they should be asking. So I wonder whether you feel that if such a template or set of templates doesn't exist, Nuffield might possibly think about <laughs> developing them. I think the real problem is, um, Roderick, is that actually there are lots of templates about how to do research, how to start by scoping your question. I mean, they range from uh, the government's uh, Magenta book, which should make you feel that government did a lot of policy evaluation, and I have to say that's not true, and that's getting worse. That really is getting worse. For instance, there's no evaluation of the Troubled Families Initiative that I know of. Uh, so, and there, the things that start at a very simple level, my sense is, and uh, this is a personal view, I'm not speaking on behalf of the foundation, that actually to make a difference in the larger and better funded charities, there have to be two things. There has to be a real will to embrace the issue, and that's why I think things like Cambridge Somerville studies should really be required reading to mm -hmm. stop people, you know, to bring them up short and think we could be hurting people. And secondly, and I know this is unpopular, they have to hire specialist staff. If you're doing really proper evaluations, even not, you know, you don't have to do RCTs, they're good for some things, they're not good for others. I'm not, I'm not making the scientific point only, but you do have to have some specialist staff. And some quite small voluntary sector bodies have that. So for instance, I would say, and it's a personal view, that Gingerbread has a very good research record and partly because they have both mothers and dads who are members, they don't make the mistake of mistaking their research simply for advocacy. You know, they start by saying, we need to know what to do here. But I, 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 it's not to say you can't get participation in all kinds of other ways in research, but that would be my uh, counsel. And one of the things with the big lottery uh, was that they did take all that seriously. When they were doing their move into this, they worked with some consultants, but they had some special, some staff finally who were senior enough to say, we've really got to sit and plan this through. Yeah. Thank you. I think the charity commission should be doing more. I mean, there is, there is an awful lot of charitable expenditure, um, supposedly under the regulation of the Charities Commission, but you're implying that most of it is potentially ill-directed. Do you think they should do more? I don't think I'd go as far as to say most of it's ill-directed, but I think what we've got is a notion of public benefit. Charities are, have to pass a public benefit test, and yet we don't really always know what's in the public benefit, even in a quite, you know, noddy sort of way. I mean, very concrete sort of way. So I'm not myself sure that the Charity Commission could say you shall spend X proportion of your income on research. I don't think that would be helpful. But I think in times gone by, it has from time to time been more active at promoting the need for charities to look at the outcomes mm. of what they do. And some statements like that do, do carry weight. Thank you very, very much. Um, any other questions that uh, uh, people have been provoked into thinking? Excellent. Hi. Um, so it's a sort of reflection on several of the talks today, and I, I, it's a sort of wonder, having spent quite a lot of time thinking about child health inequalities and being really depressed at how little we can do to change things and how difficult it was, and having read the mentoring literature and going, oh God, even that's a bad idea, and also a little bit of jealousy, because I don't live in London, so therefore <laughs> <laughs> the joy of the public transport system that you have here. Uh, what, I really, what it really made me realise is how when things are already good, somewhat good, you can make them better. When things are dire, it's kind of a lost cause. And actually, some of the mentoring literature looks a little bit like that too, that if, if there's a certain amount of stability, you can help kids 
with a little bit more, but for those who have very unstable backgrounds, a kind of simple intervention doesn't help very much. And I wonder whether part of the reason that we're all so depressed about it is that we, have, uh, we over expect. <laughs> we, uh, what we want is to think that we want to get some relative change upwards, not just about shifting the mean, but thinking about the fact that you're shifting the whole distribution a little bit. And it's hard that there are people at the bottom of the distribution who don't get a lot of help. But if we expect to be able to always help across the board, we're always going to fail. And how we can think about intelligent questions that show proportionate benefit. Well, some of Thank that I'm sure much. will come up at the panel. And I just want to say, too, it would be, I would have to be far more arrogant than I am to pronounce on mentoring when Helen Roberts is in the room, who wrote a very interesting review of different mentoring programs with others for BMJ. So, well, I have to say that Patricia was the person who made it work. OK, so you know this literature. So but I, I have to say, I don't draw quite the Council for Despair. I do agree. And look, this isn't sure I'm temperament as much as um, intellectual conviction that you know when things seem to be getting better it seems a lot easier to get them a bit better again versus when things as you say are going downhill and you know sure start and the what's happened to the number of sure start centers should be a cautionary tale for all of us um, but on the other hand I do think there are things that people are doing that are making a difference I worry when we get the well government or the charitable sector gets driven hither and thither by the latest idea coming from the US or something rather than standing back and that is a non-party political point that is true as the previous government as it is of this or any government but I do think there are things that people are doing and the whole point of using evidence is to say we can focus on things we can do something about mm -hmm. so I, I don't think this is a message of, of doom and gloom I just think we do know enough now to know that some of the big problems to do with child health and well-being we want to tackle do probably take some system change. And that raises questions about what individuals can and want to do about that. I mean, system change in the sense of more attention paid to poverty per se. We know from two authoritative Institute of Education studies that even in these troubled families with lots of risk factors, about half of their difficulties are independently explained by poverty. That is, if you took people with the same risk factors, teen pregnancy, mental health problems, low-level depression, drug problems, etc., etc., if they had a bit more money, they would do a lot better. So we know that, about half. Um, but we, there are other things we do know better than we used to about some of those other interventions. So I would say, please don't get depressed. You know, yeah. You've got to decide what you want to do about it. And, and I think just to, to, to back you up on that one, um, Sharon, I mean, certainly having worked at the National Institute for Health and Clinical Excellence and now working at the Social Care Institute for Excellence, what we're focused on in both of those organisations is finding out what works and then kind of um, uh, trying to make sure that that makes a difference. And I think that the fact that there are people who are asking those questions kind of comes back to your point as well, that if those questions are being asked and we are challenging the evidence base and actually trying to identify what we can focus our efforts on, um, we, can, we can make a difference in that way. So, uh, so I'm with you on, on not falling into the council of despair, but let's not kind of underestimate the amount of hard work that we're all going to have to put in. Um, we'll take one final question from Tabitha, because um, she's going to get her chance in a few minutes as well. <laughs> I, um, I think I, um, I don't have enough evidence to be certain about this, but I think I do agree with you saying that um, intervening, having charities there to help in a practical level is the, one of the most effective ways of uh, reducing inequality in health. But I just wanted to know, uh, based on the evidence that you have found, which are the most um, effective charities or ways of... Um, um, charitable work of of reducing equality because if I am not wrong I think he said something about counseling in the United States wasn't very effective do you would you suggest that educational intervention would be more effective I don't think this is where research was really not very good at answering a big question an important question which is what what um, charitable interventions are best at removing 
poverty. And that's one of the reasons why places like Robin Hood don't simply say, ah, project type X has the greatest return and therefore we're only going to fund project type X. Much more nuanced than that. I mean, if you look at Bill Gates in Africa, you know, he says, we want to reduce health and you start off saying we're going to develop vaccines and focus on AIDS. And then you think, well, actually, we've got to do malaria too because we've got to do these. And, you know, actually, we've got to get out into pre natal and perinatal delivery of health care because we're not going to get mums to immunize their babies. If we're, so, you know, one thing leads to another, as life often does. Um, so, so I don't think that I would say in a specific question, is counselling a, a, a particularly good way of reducing structural inequality? No. I don't, I, I mean, it can be very helpful for in, individuals. A lot depends on time rightness and who's, so how you select people in. You know, some people can be helped more than others. But if you're looking at some of the very large-scale trials of things like marriage counseling in the US or pre-marriage counseling in the US, trying to encourage people to get married in the US, uh, very, almost none of them have shown any real effect. Big epidemiological, you know, community-wide delivery of these programs. So you've got to say if an important source of inequality is family instability, and it is, um, and remember, the United States marriage, the average marriage, has a higher chance of ending than the average Swedish cohabitation. So, you know, we, we are talking about a lot other than a legal status. A lot of things are involved in that. But you, you've got to say, no, I don't, don't think counselling. It can be very important for individuals, though. And that's, you know, charities do work with individuals. That's important, too. Thank you very, very much. Um, can you join with me to thank Sharon for a fantastic uh, For all information, please visit www.gresham.ac.uk.